Good morning, everyone, and welcome to EGU 23's next press conference, which is titled Science at Night. I will shortly introduce our speakers in a minute or two. I just wanted to give a quick background that out of 17,000 abstracts submitted to EGU's meeting, we have selected the top most interesting presentations to present to you during the press conferences. Each press conference will have time for speakers to make their presentations one after the other, followed by a common question and answer round at the end, which should be about 10, 15 minutes. Right, and I like to welcome all of our speakers today. We are joined by speakers, both present in the room here, as well as online. So introducing speakers from my right, um, this is Ekta Agarwal from the Imperial College London, Department of Earth Science and Engineering London. Then we have our speakers who are joining us virtually. Can we have them on screen? Yes. So that is Diliu and Chingling Zhang from Sun Yat-sen University, School of Aeronautics and Astronautics, China. And then we are followed again by our speakers present in the room. So that's Ezgi Ashirok and Georgi Kirillin from the Leibniz Institute of Freshwater Ecology and Inland Fisheries, Berlin, Germany. So welcome all of you and um, all the best. We look forward to hearing your findings. We will begin with Ekta for today. Thank you, Tulin. Can I just check? Could you help me how to change the slides? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, well, I'm Ekta, and I'm working in Imperial College London with Alex Whitaker and Sanjeev Gupta, one of my supervisors is already in the room. And I'm actually today presenting to you that how nightlights can be used as a tool to study flood exposure, recovery, and vulnerability with respect to the recent flood event that happened in Pakistan in the Indus Basin in August 2022. So to give just a brief overview, I'm uh, one of the PhD students of the EU-funded Marie Curie ITN Source to Sync project, where we are a group of 15 PhD students working on different dynamics in a basin. And I'm working on the uh, basically human aspect uh, in our you know, learning about the human dynamics in a particular source to sing basin. So we are a group of 15 students across various universities uh, in Europe and also uh, working with many international organizations. So to start with, I would first like to show a, a time lapse. Oh, how am I able to click it? I'm sorry. Oh. Perfect. So it, it was basically a time lapse of the uh, satellite sentinel image where we could show that how the uh, how the area was flooded during the uh, during that particular flood event. And there's an inset over there in the corner. We see that how that the we basically see the um, area where there was high rainfall above the normal rainfall in that particular period. So to give a human face, uh, to give a human aspect to it, these are a few snapshots of the recent uh, event and the devastation it had caused. As per the data, almost 30 million people were affected by it, or about one third of the country was affected by it. But to understand, so like the occurrence of such flood events actually motivated or, you know, led us to thought that what are these source to sink or landscape parameters influencing this human presence near the river bodies. And for which we, uh, that motivated us to, you know, think about that, are we able to quantify human presence near the river? Then uh, second was, we all know that river is not a homogeneous body. It has a very dynamic landscape to it. So is, it, is the human presence varying with respect to different channel patterns uh, in the basin? And third, the most important is if the flood exposure and recovery, is it different for different socioeconomic classes on the floodplains in the basin. 
So we are working uh, on these questions or actually exploring these questions with the help of very interesting and cool um, uh, satellite data set, which is the night lights data. It actually captures the radiance during the nighttime. So here is a snapshot over the Indian Peninsula. Well, the PDF, it's a PDF, so I couldn't show the whole of the image. But yeah, so here we have the snapshot over the whole of Indian Peninsula. The white pixels are basically the bright areas where high, high radiance was captured during the nighttime. And the dark areas are basically where there was no capture of the data. So it was very interesting to you know, see. And the, um, one more thing, like these are the products released by NASA. So it, it was very interesting to actually think about if we can use these data to quantify human presence with respect to these landscape parameters I just mentioned to you about. So here is an example of the average distribution of nightlights over the Indus Basin. It's one of the most populous basin in the world, covering and has an area for about more than a million square, uh, kilometers square and covering about four countries, which are India, Pakistan, China, and Afghanistan. So there are a few key points in this figure. You can see that how pixels are very well distributed within the floodplain. We hardly see any presence in the mountainous areas or in the deserts. Then third is how beautifully it is following the river patterns in the basin. And fourth, which is not at all related to this study, is the, how nicely it captures the India-Pakistan border in, in, uh, in this kind of data set. So it was interesting to think about if we were able to quantify human presence using this data near the rivers. And in our existing work, we are able to show that there was 26% of enhancement um, of lit pixels with respect to the basin as a whole in the zero to five kilometer proximity of the river. Next. So we now wanted to understand whether, um, you know, intense, if we could capture the, um, the basically the impact of uh, this high intensity flood event from space. And for that, we are using the daily, da daily night lights data to understand the flood recovery and exposure within the flood plains of uh, the area affected. So here is an example of the monthly composite. August was the period where, when maximum devastation had taken place. May was basically pre-high precipitation period. So we are basically considering May as the month before precipitation started to understand if there was change in you know, presence of nightlights. And September is post-flooding event. So here very nicely, you can see in the month of August, there's absence of, oh, okay. Yeah, so this absence of, of lit pixels over there and we uh, like the, the, the lights have went off. And in September, we start to see those lights again. So uh, we could infer that yes, uh, we can capture the impact, but how much is the impact? We are still exploring, it's an ongoing study and how, how the area has recovered. So these are our further questions. Now, um, yeah, and also to understand that which areas were uh, highly impacted due to this flood event, we calculated the percentage decline in radiance. So in the first figure in the August to May ratio, you can see many red and orange color pixels. So those were basically particular areas where we could say that, you know, uh, these particular areas had high uh, flood vulnerability to human presence specifically. And that's what we are interested in. Now, if these areas had high vulnerability, but uh, is it the same for different socioeconomic classes? We don't know. So at the moment, we are using the SMART data by European Commission, which gives us an idea about the built up and population in a particular area. So here is a simplified version of the data. On x-axis, we have the percentage decline in the radiance um, in that particular flooding period. On y-axis, we have the flood exposure in terms of area kilometer square. And we have three classes, which are rural, urban cluster, and urban center, based on the classes classified by the European Commission. And we have reclassified them in terms of population and built up areas. So overall, we can see that in um, like a, with 
overall uh, rural communities are the ones who are highly exposed to this kind of flood event. And second, when we see that the percentage decline in radiance is high, which is about 50 to 75%, then the flood exposure is very much similar to both uh, rural and urban cluster. Now, our next question is, if they have similar flood exposure, so uh, do they have same recovery? Do they have different recovery? I don't know personally. We are still working on it. And next, and the second aspect to it is because it was a high intensity flood event. So, uh, like, it would be interesting to also see whether it follows the same pattern, like same recovery uh, pattern, with respect to the different intensity flood events um, through in this particular area. So lastly, the key takeaway points from my presentation are that we were able to quantify human presence uh, 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 in the Indus Basin with the help of the night lights data. And second, maximum number of uh, the majority of area uh, had a maximum had a minimum decline of 25 percentage in radiance. And uh, lastly, these data can actually be used to ex uh, estimate the flood exposure and recovery time period. So like the information gathered from this kind of um, study can help the community to understand what kind of situation they are living in and also help the policymakers and government to, you know, uh, and to basically understand which area to focus the disaster management in uh, in a in in an event of occurrence of such uh, flooding event like this. So yeah, and I would like to acknowledge my colleagues from Imperial College London, my S2S project colleagues over there. So yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm open to questions after the talk. Thank you very much, Ekta. We will now hear from our virtual speakers, Di Liu and uh, Chingling Zhang. So we are just going to load your slides, which will take a couple of minutes, and then you are welcome to start your presentation. Unless the speakers want to share their slides. Okay, they are. Okay, great. Hello? Yes, hello, we can hear you. We can hear you, but uh, your video is off. So can you do a quick adjustment, please? We cannot see you. Chingling, um, any chance that you can hear us? We would like to see your video and hear your audio as well, please. Okay, I think in the interest of time, we will move to our next speakers. And um, in the meantime, if uh, our virtual speakers could please check their audio and video, because we can see your slides, we can see you moving your presentation, but we cannot hear you or see you. We will uh, move on to Esgi and Georgi, please. And then we will come back to our virtual speakers. Thank you. Yes, thank you for inviting us. Our story is about very long nights taking place to the north of the polar circle. And the title is Breathing at Sleep, uh, Respiration in Arctic Lake during polar night. So why we actually started this study and why we are interested uh, in what's happening under ice or lake. Uh, the 
And studies of lakes under ice started maybe 20 years ago before we didn't know anything about them. Uh, normally it was assumed that lakes are sleeping and nothing is happening between two open water periods. But actually uh, we found out that uh, dynamics under ice is very, very uh, uh, complex and has many different facets Still, uh, most of attention was put on the period of spring, where solar radiation penetrates the ice, and the period before the ice comes. And the period of the polar night uh, was not attended. Actually, it has no light, so we don't have any uh, photosynthesis. We don't have any contact to atmosphere. And all these lakes, which are thousands to the north of the polar circle, still uh, remain uninvestigated and we just want to understand what's happening when uh, climate change or global change affect this period there and that's why we started our studies on late upc area and the question we stated for us what is the metabolism is the lake really sleeping is there any life and how active it is there so uh, the main parameter we tried to estimate was the oxygen and we look for a connection between oxygen as an integrate parameter for the whole metabolism for microbial activity and uh, physical parameters which are driven by climate like water temperature mixing currents and like uh, morphometry like lake depths so definitely this uh, parameters affect the oxygen and lakes. It doesn't move by any reason. So now, uh, very shortly about our measure findings there, I uh, can show you. So on the, on the left panel, you can see the vertical distribution of respiration rates. So how do they breathe under ice? And there is a certain pattern with increase the vertical gradient uh, towards the bottom and respiration, which is more or less consistent between different years. So the, the deeper it is, the more active is the respiration. But on the right panel, uh, there are several lines showing uh, sediment respiration at different years. And you can see that they're quite variable from year to year. So they're very sensitive to what is happening before the ice comes, before the polar night starts and they're very sensitive uh, to the conditions uh, during this very long period of several months or otherwise. And at this point, uh, I would like to hand over to ASU, the real night specialist who did the study and he knows all the details about it. Yeah. Thank you, Georgi. Um, I will continue with where we are conducting this study. Uh, we are working on Lake Kirpisjärvi. It is located in the northern Finland. Uh, there is a very nice biological station of Helsinki University, which can provide uh, very good facilities for our um, project. And we are um, taking samples and saving the data from Kirpisjärvi since 2013. And Lake Kirpisjärvi is a ice-covered lake. It is ultra oligotrophic, and it is uh, covered with ice for almost seven months. And here we can see the light properties of the lake. Actually, the polar nights are starting in the 1st of December, but even after the polar nights, we can see that uh, the solar radiation is still very low until the 20th of April. So Mainly, we are focusing on this period for this study. So our lake is in darkness, uh, like almost for four months. It's a long time uh, for biological activities. So we can shortly see our methods in here. We are using a autonomous high resolution oxygen and temperature measurements. And on the left hand side, there is a like very basic illustration of our um, boys and measurement devices. Uh, we are using temperature and dissolved oxygen loggers, and uh, it is 43 meters long. 
And on the middle image, we can see how the physical uh, parameters can affect the physics and biogeochemistry uh, under the eyes, such as solar radiation, temperature, and uh, density changes. And there is one example of temperature and oxygen records belongs to 2020 winter time. As it can be seen, uh, the lake temperature is changing between uh, zero and four degrees. But starting from the December, actually, we can see that the deepest part of the lake is becoming high, uh, anoxic, like in a very short time. And uh, now it is not our like main focus, but it can create uh, anaerobic uh, conditions, which can lead to production of methane gases. And here uh, we can see what actually we are gonna focus next to, next as a next step. I mean, now we are working on the polar nights and dark time of the year, but then we will start working on the ice covered period with solar radiation. So with that time, we can see how our respiration rates can actually respond to solar radiation and primary production. And we can see how the solar radiation is increasing after 20 of April. So uh, it will be a good opportunity to uh, research on this subject. And if you have any questions, you can see our contact details here. And thank you. Thank you very much. And now the good news is we can see our virtual speakers. We can have their video. And if you can also share your slides, we will let you know if we can see and hear you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, loud and clear. Okay, can you, can you see my slide? Not yet. Uh, no? I, I, yeah, yeah, sorry. Can you mm -hmm. Yep, yep, you can see it. Oh, one second, please. Oh, sorry. Can you now? Can you... Yes, you're ready to begin. We're yes. sorry about this inconvenience. Uh, no problem. It happens. Hello, everyone. And now uh, uh, we will start our talk. It's our honor to have this chance to share our study in the Arctic regions. Arctic region. Um, our talk. Uh, the title is Studying How Ice and the Snow Behave in the Arctic with Spatial Satellite Cameras. My name is uh, Zhang Qingli, and uh, Liu Di is my uh, PhD student. We are from Sun Yat-sen University, China. Uh, the first uh, uh, is a big picture uh, about the background. As we know, Arctic Ocean actually is a region very sensitive to climate change. And uh, we can see in, the, in March, the ice, the sea ice actually will uh, grow dramatically and the reach is maximum uh, in March. But it will also melt in the summer and the reach is uh, minimum uh, in September. So we actually recently started to show that uh, the Arctic uh, uh, sea ocean, the sea ice actually de declined 2.5% per decade. And uh, also there is a big uh, seasonal variation as we can see. So in this, we make a conclusion that even during the dark polarized periods, the sea ice in this region actually change, change dramatically. So that requires an urgent need to monitor Arctic Ocean continuously, especially during dark polarized periods. This is the background. So why uh, we uh, carry out this study? And uh, 
as the previous uh, research just the research showed, we have a now uh, a spatial satellite camera on board in, in this space uh, provide, provides us a capability to see the uh, ground surface in the, even when there is no sunlight. As we can see that when there is no sunlight with the moon on, actually we can see a lot of features on the uh, Earth's surface. So in this study, we, we use uh, uh, data from a spatial satellite camera. It's called a VS DMB. Uh, the pre previous research as we showed, it's fantastic uh, images. But in this study, in our study, we focus on uh, regions without uh, artificial lights, like uh, street lights. We only see to test the capability of this camera to see Arctic regions, now, even when there is no sunlight, with faint moonlight. Now, as we know that uh, there is a long period in the Arct Arct Arctic regions when there is a no sunlight, but uh, fortunately we have moonlight um, each month to illuminate the polar regions. So this is allowing us to see polar snow ice and their, their change, even during the polarized periods. And this is our results. Actually, we focused on, as a research uh, project, we, we chose a Svalbard a small uh, region compared to the entire uh, polar, polar region. And uh, this, this, this location actually is, uh, uh, we know that there is a global seed uh, vault actually located in this island. And the reason we chose this, uh, uh, this, this uh, archipelago is not only because of this, it's because of the location. It's location, uh, located actually uh, home. It looks like we're frozen again. Can you hear us by any chance? Because your video has frozen. Oh, I see. If you can hear us, maybe try rejoining and we can give you a minute or two. Apologies to everyone for the interruption. Uh, we'll give them another minute or so. Um, but if we don't hear back from them, then you can contact them uh, later if you'd like to have a few informal or formal chats or interviews. I can send you their details. Yeah, we can see your slides moving now, which is good. But we cannot see your video anymore. Maybe you can minimize the screen so that we can read their takeaway messages. Yeah.
Okay. Apologies again for that. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like we are going to hear back from our speakers. So we will just now move on to the next part of our press conference, which is the question and answer round. So if you have any questions for our speakers today, um, if they are for the on-site speakers, then you're most welcome to either raise your hand and I'll come to you with a microphone. Uh, and if they are the virtual speakers, then feel free to write to me and I will send you their contact information. If you're joining us virtually, you can uh, leave your questions either in the chat or you can use the hand raising function on Zoom and I will come to you for your question. So if anyone has any questions for our speakers, um, let us know, the floor is yours. Okay, we have a question coming. Hi, my name is uh, Katrin and I'm with the EGU press team here. Um, I was curious for the team who did the research in Finland, um, the extent of your collaboration with the SAMI Council to coordinate uh, this research. Oh, I guess I can take it, yeah. If you did collaborate with the council, sorry, what was the question? Or if we got oh, the... uh, did you collaborate with the council to coordinate the research? Were they involved? Uh, not yet. In the project? At least not yet. Uh, we did about 10 years of research there, mostly collaborating with the University of Helsinki. Um, and this certain project actually is an initiative of German uh, Ministry of Educa for Education and Research. Uh, in collaboration with our Finnish colleagues in, in University of Helsinki. Uh. Hmm. Sure, thank you. Do we have any other questions coming in? Doesn't seem to be any questions on um, the chat from our virtual speakers, virtual uh, journalists. Okay, if there are no more questions, we are ready to conclude our press briefing. Thank you once again to all of our speakers for joining us today. They are available. If you'd like to ask any questions through the week, you can run them through me and I'll be happy to facilitate. Uh, just as a reminder, this press conference was recorded and we will upload it later in the day to EGU's YouTube channel. And uh, we have another press conference planned for later today at 2 p.m. Uh, the title is called what can chocolate, cereal, and water say about food security and sustainability? So that's another exciting one to look forward to, and I hope to see some of you there. Thank you once again, and enjoy the rest of your day.